Welcome back to the channel. My name is Tom and today I'm at the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. The last time I was here was about five years ago back in 2018 and since then they have made some changes to the museum. They've added some new exhibits. Uh, there are some aircraft here now that weren't there back in 2018 and they even have a high-tech flight simulator as well. So if you're into history, aviation, or just looking at shiny aircraft, this is the video for you, so stay tuned. And in case you're wondering, the museum's open every day except for major holidays, and adult admission is $21, which I think is well worth the price. Also, just a disclaimer, most of the information I'm going to provide in this video is based on the signs at the Air Museum and Wikipedia, so if I get anything wrong, I do apologize. First up is the Sikorsky CH-54B TAR, also known as the Sky Crane. It was originally designed in 1962. This is the B variant, which is a later, heavier duty version. It's powered by two Pratt & Whitney T-73P 700 engines, which have 4,800 horsepower each. And that enables it to carry up to 25,000 pounds or 45 combat troops at once. And just to give you a better idea of what kind of carrying capacity that is, these are actually able to transport tanks. Seeing this helicopter brings back a lot of memories to me. I don't live too far from here, and I distinctly remember back in the 80s seeing these sky cranes flying over my house all the time until they finally disappeared around the early 90s, which is when they were taken out of service. Hanging from the ceiling is the Pratt Reed LNE-1. It's a two-seat glider that was built in 1943. It was originally used to train pilots during World War II, but after the war it was sold as surplus, and in 1952 it set the high altitude record for two-seat gliders at 44,255 feet. This is the Republic P-47D Thunderbolt. The P-47 was produced between 1942 and 1945. This D variant was introduced around 1945, and it was the heaviest single-engine fighter during all of World War II. It was used as a pursuit aircraft and also a fighter bomber. And as you can see, it carried eight 50 caliber machine guns in the wings. And this D variant was the first variant to have a bubble canopy, which provided improved visibility over previous designs. This particular aircraft served in Italy in 1945. This is the Douglas A-20 Havoc G. The Douglas A-20 was produced between 1939 and 1944, and this variant, the Havoc G, was the most produced version. There's over 2,850 of these that were built, and it served as a medium bomber, a night fighter, and attack aircraft. And it was finally retired from service by the U.S. Air Force in 1949. I believe that's a camera there in the nose of the plane. If I'm wrong, let me know in the comments. Now let's head on up and take a look in the cockpit. See what's going on inside there. And also, if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment, and hit that notification bell. If you're not familiar with my channel, I generally do flea market videos, mall walkthroughs, store walkthroughs, as well as occasionally videos like this on museums, abandoned places, and other historical locations. Thanks. Here's an alternate nose cone for the plane, which as you can see adds additional machine guns.
I think this one's pretty cool. This is a Pratt & Whitney J58 afterburning turbojet engine. This was used in the SR-71 Blackbird as well as its predecessors, the A-12 and YF-12. This engine can propel an aircraft at over Mach 3 and it actually helped the SR-71 reach the absolute speed record of 2,193 miles an hour. Here's the high-tech flight simulator I was talking about. This is an FA-18 simulator. And as you can see under the center monitor there, they're using a gaming computer to run this. I would imagine to run this at the speed they're running it, it was built within probably the last couple of years, probably 2021 or newer. I didn't see any specs though. But essentially it's running three 55 inch TVs as far as I can tell. The only thing that doesn't appear to be off the shelf to me is that chair and controller. But let's take a look at it in action. This is the Pratt & Whitney PW6000 turbofan engine. It entered service in 2007, powering the Airbus A318. Here's the Westinghouse J34 turbojet engine. It was first tested in 1945 and was the only truly successful turbojet engine built by Westinghouse. This is the Rolls-Royce RB41 Neen turbojet engine that was first tested in 1944. And here's the GE J31. It's the first mass-produced jet engine in the United States. This is the North American B25H Mitchell. The B-25 was produced between 1938 and 1946. This one was built in 1944 and was the same type of bomber used by General Jimmy Doolittle during his raids on Tokyo. The B-25 was powered by two 1,700 horsepower engines, had a top speed of about 275 miles an hour, and had a range of up to 1,350 miles. This is the MD-22 flight simulator. This is the cockpit module of a larger and more complex F-100C Super Sabre simulator. I didn't see a date on this, but the F-100C was produced between 1953 and 1959, so this would have been from that time period. And I actually remember this being here when I was a kid, and I'm pretty sure I got in it. I think you can still go in it today, but I didn't feel like uh, getting stuck, so I didn't get in. Here's the Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet engine from 1950, which at the time was the most powerful turbojet engine in the world. And these are the M39 20mm guns from the next jet we're going to look at, the F100 Super Sabre. And here it is, the F100 Super Sabre. It was produced between 1953 and 1959. It was powered by a single Pratt & Whitney J57 turbojet engine with an afterburner. It had four 20 millimeter cannons and had a payload capacity of between 6,000 and 7,500 pounds. It entered service in 1954 and was the world's first production supersonic fighter. Originally designed for use against Soviet aircraft during the Cold War, it ended up seeing quite a bit of action during the Vietnam War and it wasn't retired by the US military until 1979. Now this jet has to be in my top five favorite of all time. This is the Lockheed F-104C Starfighter. The first prototype flew in 1954 and it was in service with the U.S. Air Force from 1958 to 1969 and then it ended its career with the National Guard when it was retired in 1975. 
It's powered by a single GE J79 afterburning turbojet. And the thing that makes it very unusual are the wings. As you can see, they're very narrow. They're only seven and a half feet long each, which is very short for a jet like this. And this is actually the first combat jet able to fly at Mach 2 for an extended period of time. This particular one here actually set the altitude and speed record in 1962 when it flew at Mach 2.5 at 92,000 feet. And this is without a doubt my favorite aircraft of all time. This is the Fairchild Republic A-10A Thunderbolt II. It's named after the P-47 Thunderbolt, which we looked at earlier. However, today it's better known as the A-10 Warthog. It first flew in 1972 and entered service in 1976. Later versions are still in service to this day. It has a maximum speed of 460 miles an hour and it's powered by two GE TF-34 GE100 turbofans. The A-10 was designed to provide close air support to ground troops and to destroy tanks and pretty much any other type of vehicle you can imagine. Its primary armament is the 30mm GAU A8 Avenger rotary cannon, which you can see here. And here's an example of that iconic gun sound. I think one of the reasons I like this aircraft so much is that it was probably the first military jet I'd ever seen in person as they used to be stationed right here at the local Connecticut Air National Guard base and they would fly over my house all the time. This is a cockpit simulator for a Grumman E-1B Tracer. They actually have an E-1B Tracer outside so we'll take a look at that later but this is what it looks like on the inside. This is the Command SH-2F Sea Sprite. It first flew in 1959 and was in service with the U.S. Navy from 1962 until 1993. It was manufactured by Command Aircraft, which is located just about 10 minutes from here in Bloomfield, Connecticut. Its primary use was for search and rescue and anti-submarine warfare. It's powered by two GE T-58 GE-8F gas turbine engines and has a maximum speed of 143 miles an hour and it's got a range of 500 nautical miles. It's a ship-based helicopter, and its primary armaments include M60 machine guns, depth charges, and MK4650 homing torpedoes. This is the Command HH-43F Husky. This model first flew in 1953 and was retired in the early 1970s. This particular aircraft was built in 1960, and its primary purpose was to reach downed aircraft and it had the equipment necessary to put out fires and rescue flight crews. This specific aircraft was actually used as a plane guard for Air Force One, which means it escorted takeoffs and landings of Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. during the time of Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. And it also has the distinctive twin intermeshing rotors that many command aircraft have to this day. And here we have the Command HOK-1, which was later redesignated as the OH-43D Husky. It's essentially a variant of the helicopter we just looked at. Its primary use was for scouting and observation, whereas the other one was primarily used for firefighting. And here we have the Command K-225. This is actually the fifth helicopter ever built by Command, and it's currently Command's oldest surviving aircraft. It was first flown in 1948, and it's basically an improved version of the K-125, which was Command's first helicopter. And it's also one of the first helicopters to use the twin intermeshing rotors. And as you can probably see, this helicopter led to the development of the HOK-1 and HS-43 Huskies that we just looked at. While the A-10 Warthog is my favorite airplane at this museum, this is definitely my favorite helicopter. This is the Bell AH-1S Cobra. The Cobra was first flown in 1965 and was in service with the U.S. Army from 1967 to 2001. However, the U.S. Marine Corps continued to use a variant of this, the AH-1W Super Cobra, until 2020. And the Marine Corps continues to use the AH-1Z Viper to this day. 
Surprisingly, some of the U.S. Army's retired Cobras were given to the USDA's Forest Service. This version is also called the Tow Cobra because of its eight tow anti-tank missiles. It's powered by a Lycoming T-53L703 turbine engine, has a top speed of 205 miles an hour, and a range of 342 miles. I thought this was interesting. Right next to the Cobra, they have some old computers set up running Microsoft Flight Simulator. These appear to be computers from the late 90s, early 2000s, maybe up to 2005 or so. I would guess they're Pentium 4s. And I think they're running Flight Simulator either 98, 2000, or 2002, most likely. So they're pretty out of date, but, you know, I guess they still get the job done. Next up, we have the Bell UH-1B Iroquois, a.k.a. the Huey. Uh, the Huey first flew in 1956 and was in service with the U.S. military from 1959 to present. This particular model was built in 1962. I think today most people would associate this helicopter with the Vietnam War. It's powered by a Lycoming T-53 gas turbine engine and was primarily used as a utility aircraft, a medevac, and a gunship, and it could also carry about six fully equipped troops. Here we have the Hughes OH-6A Cayuse. This is a light observation helicopter that was used primarily by the U.S. Army and was first flown in 1963. This particular aircraft was built in 1967. It's powered by a 411 horsepower Allison 250 turbine engine and has a top speed of about 152 miles an hour. During the Vietnam War, this helicopter would work with the Cobra attack helicopters as a kind of hunter-killer team. And variants of this helicopter actually continue to be built to this day. In fact, the helicopter flown by TC in the TV show Magnum PI was a civilian variant of this helicopter. This museum also has a great collection of scale models. And this is probably my favorite aircraft of all time, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. I've never seen one of these in person, but I hope to someday. And here's the Lockheed YF-12A, which is essentially an early version of the SR-71 Blackbird. Here's another famous aircraft. This is a Lockheed 10A Electra. The Electra was first flown in 1934 and was an all-metal twin-engine airliner built to compete with the Douglas DC-2 and the Boeing 247. It could carry up to 10 passengers and a crew of three. And this is actually the same type of plane flown by Amelia Earhart when she disappeared in 1937. One of the easiest ways for me to identify this aircraft is by that circular antenna above the flight deck. I could be wrong, but I haven't seen too many other aircraft that have an antenna that looks quite like that. Here's one of the more unusual aircraft at the museum. This is the Bernelli CBY-3 Loadmaster. This aircraft is one of one, as it never went into commercial production. It was built in 1944 and first flew in 1945. It's a lifting body aircraft, which means that the fuselage actually acts as a lifting body, like the wings do. And this aircraft flew regularly as a commercial airliner in South America and northern Canada and ended its days flying out of Baltimore, Maryland, where it was eventually abandoned. It's been with the museum since 1972, or 1964, depending on what source you look at. 
the airplane was already damaged by the time the museum got it, and it was damaged even more in 1979 during a tornado. They started restoration on it in 2012. That was finished in 2020, and since then it's been on display inside the museum. I'm not sure what this aircraft is here. If anybody knows, let me know in the comments. The museum also has this amazing collection of old airplane paintings. This is the Nixon Special. It was hand-built by John Nixon in 1918. It was flown until 1926 and was then put into storage. It wasn't flown again until 1958, then was put back into storage and was eventually acquired by the museum. Here we have the Sikorsky H-52A Seaguard. The H-52 first flew in 1958 and was in service with the U.S. Coast Guard from 1961 to 1989. This particular helicopter was built in 1967. It's an amphibious search and rescue helicopter, and this one was stationed at the Detroit Coast Guard Air Station until 1989. What makes it amphibious is that it can not only fly, but it can float in the water as well. As you can see, the underside is shaped like a boat's hull, and the landing gear pods also serve as pontoons. This is the Douglas DC-3. The DC-3 first flew in 1935 and was introduced in 1936. This specific aircraft was built in 1942 and is powered by two Curtis Wright R1820 Cyclone engines. It had a cruising speed of 207 miles an hour and a range of 1,500 miles. And this particular DC-3 was originally ordered by American Airlines but was taken over by the U.S. Army Air Force in 1942. It was completed as a C-49J and was used to transport troops during World War II, but after the war it was converted back to a DC-3 and was initially operated by Eastern Airlines and then a few other carriers. This is a Bill U-11. It's a French monoplane that first flew in 1909. A plane of this type was actually the first heavier-than-air aircraft to cross the English Channel. This massive aircraft is the Sikorsky VS-44A flying boat, Excambian. It was built in 1942 for non-stop commercial transatlantic passenger service. During World War II, this aircraft flew regular flights across the Atlantic carrying passengers and freight. And after the war, it flew for various shuttle services in California and the Virgin Islands. There were only ever three VS-44As ever built, and this is the only one to survive. It was restored between 1988 and 1998, and it's been here ever since. This is the North American P-51 Mustang. The Mustang first flew in 1940 and was introduced in 1942. It was a long-range fighter and fighter bomber that was mainly used during World War II and the Korean War to escort bombers. This specific aircraft was built too late to see combat in World War II, so it was purchased as surplus and was eventually converted into a racing plane and actually won the Thompson Trophy in 1948 during the national air races. Restoration was completed on this airplane in 2015, and it's currently in its 1949 air race configuration. This is the Marco Bromberg Special. It was originally built in 1933 as the Ryder R3. It then got sold and was modified by the Marco Bromberg team in 1934. 
And as a racing plane, it placed high in numerous races and won the 1936 Golden Gate Trophy. And it also appeared in the 1938 Clark Gable movie, Test Pilot. This is the Laird LCDW300 solution. It's a racing plane that was built by E.M. Laird in 1930. It was built with the sole purpose of racing in the first ever Thompson Trophy race. And amazingly, it won the race. Here's another racing plane. This is a replica of the GB Super Sportster R1. The original plane was built in 1932 with the sole purpose of racing and it won the Thompson Trophy in 1932. It also set some speed records. This replica was built here at the museum using the original plans. However, from what I've read, this replica is not airworthy. This is the Sikorsky S-39B. This particular plane first flew in 1930 and it's actually the oldest Sikorsky aircraft still in existence. It's an amphibious plane, which means it can take off from both land and water. And during World War II, it was used by the Civil Air Patrol in Delaware for air-sea rescue missions. It ended its career in 1957 as an Alaskan bush plane when it crashed, and it's been here since 1963. Here we have the Doman YH-31, which later became known as the LZ-5. This helicopter was delivered to the U.S. Army in 1955. It was a utility helicopter, and only three of them were ever built. It uses a gimbaled rotor head system, which eliminated the need for rotor hinges and dampers. The tail rotor was also hingeless, and the engine was cooled by exhaust ejectors, which increased the payload by about 800 pounds. This is the Sikorsky R6. It's a two-seat helicopter that first flew in 1943. It included a new streamlined body, and the boom carrying the tail rotor was straightened and lengthened. It was later modified by Doman Helicopters. They were originally flown by the U.S. Navy and the Royal Air Force, but eventually made it into the civil aircraft market in the late 40s, but none are currently operational. Next up is the Republic RC-3CB. This is another amphibious aircraft and was designed to be a low-cost aircraft for sportsmen. This particular aircraft was built in 1948 and has a top speed of about 120 miles an hour. It kind of reminds me of those personal aircraft of the future they used to talk about in the 1950s where they imagined people flying planes to the office in order to avoid traffic jams. The seats even look like they're from a car. Here's the Sikorsky S-59, also known as the XH-39. It's basically a conversion of the S-52 helicopter from piston to turbine power. Only three were ever produced, and it set a world speed record for helicopters at 156 miles an hour, and the altitude record at 24,500 feet. This particular one was used by Sikorsky for demonstration purposes. Next to the S-59, we have the S-51. It was built in 1947 and was Sikorsky's first civilian helicopter. This one was originally flown by the Royal Canadian Air Force. Here's the last helicopter of the day. This is the Sikorsky R-4B. This one was delivered in 1943 and was the first mass-produced helicopter in the world. It was also the first helicopter to be used by the U.S. Army Air Force, U.S. Navy, U.S. Coast Guard, and the U.K.'s Royal Navy and Air Force. An R-4 was also used in the first U.S. helicopter rescue when it carried blood plasma for casualties following the sinking of the USS Turner in 1944. This is a cockpit simulator for a Boeing 707. And I actually remember this very clearly being here in the 1980s when I came as a kid. And I think back then you could get inside it. That's my recollection. The 707 first flew in 1957 and was the first jetliner produced by Boeing commercial airplanes. And in my opinion, the 707 was the first modern appearing jet aircraft. In fact, if you were to see one today being flown by American Airlines or Delta, most people would just assume it's a modern aircraft. And also a 707 was used as Air Force One from 1962 all the way up into 2001, believe it or not. I think this is probably one of the most unusual exhibits at the Air Museum. This is the control car from a Goodyear ZNPK non-rigid airship or blimp. This one was designated K-28. 
It was built in 1942 and was powered by two Pratt & Whitney R1340 WASP engines, which gave it a top speed of about 68 miles an hour. And this specific one was used as an anti-submarine convoy escort during World War II. Then after the war, it went back to Goodyear to become one of the Goodyear blimps and was renamed the Puritan. And then it was finally retired in 1948. As you can see, this one still has a machine gun in it, which I would assume almost certainly was removed when it was being used as one of the Goodyear blimps. Before this, I think the only control car to a blimp or a zeppelin I've seen before was the one in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, which obviously was for a much larger blimp and was, of course, fictional. But this is much, much smaller than the one depicted in the Indiana Jones movie. So I'm not sure if the control cars actually got as big as the ones in the Indiana Jones movie or if that was just, you know, for the movies. And of course the reason for all the glass is that this was used as an anti-submarine convoy escort during World War II, so you'd want to be able to see out the windows basically to see if there are any submarines down below. And here's a scale model of what it would have looked like back during World War II. Here we have the star of the show, the Boeing B-29 Superfortress. The B-29 first flew in 1942 and was introduced in 1944, which was towards the end of World War II. It's a four-engine heavy bomber and was used mostly during World War II and the Korean War. It was one of the largest aircraft of World War II and included new technologies such as an analog computer-controlled fire control system which allowed the gunner and fire control officer to use four remote 50 caliber Browning M2 machine gun turrets. It also had a pressurized cabin, which allowed it to fly at much higher altitudes than its predecessor, the B-17. Also, modified versions of the B-29 were used to drop the atomic bombs on Japan during World War II. This particular B-29, Jack's Hack, never served overseas during World War II, but served with training units until the late 1940s. During the 50s, it was based in the UK and Libya, and was then put into storage in 1956. It was actually set to be used for target practice, but thankfully that never happened. Here's one of those remote control turrets, and you can tell it's remote controlled because there's no window or bubble in it like you would have seen in a B-17, for example. There's the bomb bay doors.
Here's an observation bubble and with what I believe is a camera mounted in it. And it's a little bit hard to get an idea of scale in this video, but that tail is enormous. There's the tail gun, and you can see actually right above it there's a little window where the tail gunner would have sat. Now let's get a little bit better view from above. Here's the Clark Tor 6 airport tug from the 1940s and this would have been used to move aircraft around military installations and also to pull trailers like that. This is the Grumman FM2 Wildcat. It first flew in 1937 and was the primary fighter plane of the US Navy, Marines and Royal Navy at the beginning of World War II. Here we have the Vought XF4U4 Corsair. It was designed as a carrier-based aircraft and was one of the best fighter bombers of World War II and also the Korean War. It can be easily identified by the inverted gull wing, which was designed to provide extra ground clearance for its huge propeller. And this one was actually the first Corsair ever produced. This is the Grumman F6F5 Hellcat, which is the successor to the FM2 Wildcat that we looked at earlier. It went into service in 1943 and was designed to be maneuverable enough to take on Japan's fighters. As a result, it ended up being responsible for the majority of Japanese fighters shot down during World War II. This biplane is the Stearman PT-17. While it looks like something out of World War I, it was actually built in 1941 as a trainer aircraft for the U.S. Army and Navy, as well as its allies. This particular aircraft served at the Tuskegee Army Airfield from 1943 to 1945, which was the main training facility for African American pilots at the time. Next up is this Grumman 150 SE2 turret, which is from a Grumman TBM 3E Avenger. It's from 1943 and was one of the first powered ball turrets that could work in a single engine aircraft. It has a 50 caliber machine gun and used one and a half inch thick glass to protect the gunner. And this is a scale model of the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress. I wouldn't mind having this in my collection, that's for sure. Might be a little bit out of my price range though. Now we're going to head outside where they have some additional aircraft on display. Most of these aircraft have been outside for decades and are not in the best condition. Hopefully they'll all be fully restored someday. Also I seem to remember when I came here as a kid back in the 80s that there used to be a lot more aircraft out here and I also remember being able to go inside a lot of them but I might be misremembering that. First up we have the de Havilland C7A Caribou, originally called the DHC4 Caribou. It first flew in 1958 and was introduced in 1961. This is a Canadian built aircraft and was designed as a military transport and later used as a utility and cargo aircraft. 
It has a short takeoff and landing capability, which enables it to use runways as short as 1,200 feet. A few of these are still used today as bush aircraft. Next we have the Douglas A3B Sky Warrior. It was a strategic bomber. This is the main production variant which entered service in 1957. It operated from aircraft carriers and was the largest and heaviest aircraft to do so at the time. It was also used for reconnaissance, mid-air refueling, and electronic warfare. It was finally retired in 1991. This is the Grumman HU-16E Albatross, originally called the SA-16B and UF-1G. It was designed by the U.S. Navy as an amphibious utility aircraft that was also capable of using skis to take off from ice and snow. As you can see by the shape of it, it could also take off and land in water. It first flew in 1949 and this one was built in 1953. <clears throat> It was mainly used as a search and rescue aircraft and was retired by the U.S. Coast Guard in 1983, but there are still many of these being used today in civilian operations. Here we have the Martin RB-57A Canberra, which was built in 1954. The B-57A was a tactical bomber, and this variant, the RB-57A, was a photo reconnaissance aircraft and was actually a modified version of the British-English electric Canberra. This version was taken out of active military service in 1958, and most of them were transferred to the U.S. National Guard, where they were used to complete photographic surveys of the U.S. until 1971. It was replaced in military use by the U-2 and the SR-71. And last but not least, we have the Grumman E-1B Tracer. It was the first aircraft specifically designed for airborne early warning. It first flew in 1956 and was eventually retired in 1977. It features folding wings so that it can easily be stored on aircraft carriers and as you can see, had an enormous radar system mounted on top. This particular aircraft is dedicated to Lou Rell, who flew the aircraft when he was a U.S. Navy pilot and also amazingly helped to restore it. And before we leave, we have to check out the gift shop. I would say this is probably the best gift shop I've ever seen at a museum. If you're into aviation or anything military, you definitely want to come out here because they have some amazing stuff here that you really can't find anywhere else. And also a lot of this stuff, you can find it online, but you know this is an easy place to find it all in one spot. And also, uh, you do not have to pay admission to get into the gift shop. So if you want to just come out to the gift shop and you know not look at the aircraft, you can do that too. These flight helmets are pretty cool. If I was a kid, I would have picked one of these up. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't fit my head nowadays, but um, really cool. Now, in addition to toys and souvenirs, they actually do have historical documents here. These are various manuals, textbooks, you name it. All kinds of random material on aircraft. And also, if you're into scale models of aircraft, this is definitely the place to come because they have an enormous selection. I was really tempted here to pick up one of each airline, but I was able to control myself. Luckily I only live about 10 minutes away from here, so if I ever change my mind I can just drive on down and pick some up.
And they were priced well. These were only 10 bucks each. In addition to the brand new scale models they have for sale, they also have these vintage ones here. From what I understand, these were part of some guy's collection and he donated them to the museum and now they're selling them. They're definitely not cheap, that's for sure, but they're pretty awesome. So if there's an aircraft scale model you're looking for, odds are they probably have it here. That B-52 bomber was very tempting. Just a little bit more than I can afford at this point. Oh my gosh! Yeah. An experience. Yeah. They also have a nice selection of cups and mugs. Uh, and if you've seen any of my other videos, especially my flea market videos, you may know I'm into character glasses. And these aren't exactly character glasses, but they're close. So I did end up picking up one of these um, Air Museum glasses here. They were decently priced. I think it was six dollars, which is about what I would pay for a glass like that at a flea market. I was at another museum not too long ago, and they were selling similar glasses. You know, not the same subject, but similar for I think like twenty-five dollars. So these are priced very well. And there you have it. That's the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. I hope you liked the video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment, and hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.